The following program is a co-production of Seattle Channel and Seattle City Club and sponsored by Comcast. A resurgence of white supremacist violence is fueling a new wave of terror. When we think about what's happening, right, these are functionally, by definition, lynchings, right? This is what this is. What's being done to combat it? We have universal background checks. We have some more restrictions on, on assault rifles being purchased by someone who's over 21. And we have the extreme risk protection order. And the author of The Art of Racing in the Rain shares life through the eyes of Enzo. If you could take anything away from the book, I think that we should all learn to teach, treat each other more like dogs. It's all coming up on Civic Cocktail. I'm Joni Balter here tonight discussing white supremacy and violence prevention with King County Prosecuting Attorney Dan Satterberg and University of Washington political science professor Christopher Parker. The journalists who are helping with the questions this evening are Marcus Harrison Green, formerly as of about maybe 10 minutes ago of the Seattle Times and now from the South Seattle Emerald. We also have Katie Sewell, host of the Bittersweet Life podcast and she's also on KUOW. Dan Satterberg, we start with you. Uh, in recent years, the number of reported hate crimes has been increasing across the country. And reported is an important word, as I understand. What has been the experience here in, in King County, Washington? Well, hate crimes is one of those areas when reporting goes up, you actually feel good about it. It's not necessarily that more of it's happening, it's that people are feeling safe and feeling like they don't have to tolerate this kind of activity anymore. They can call and something will happen. Well, we've had a, a, a very active hate crime prosecution unit for about 20, 25 years. In fact, our senior deputy prosecutor, Mike Hogan, is here tonight. He's done this uh, for us for a very long time. Um, it's gone up about 400% in the last six years here in Seattle. That so like it's a lot. Quite a lot. It's quadrupled. Uh, but again, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily mean that, that more of it's happening. I want to distinguish, and I think it's important for this discussion, for you to understand that the cases that we put into the state superior court for hate crimes are usually involving people who are intoxicated and or have severe behavioral health issues, uh, who have picked somebody out at random because of what they appear to be to that person a member of a, of a discrete uh, group based on their race or sexual orientation, and that they, they go in and they will make threats, or maybe they'll even assault them. Uh, those are usually individuals, not groups, uh, and, and they uh, typically are just people who aren't thinking very clearly, their inhibitions are gone, and their inner racist self is coming out, perhaps. I want to distinguish that from what I think is much more f frightening, and that is the rise of the white supremacist extremist groups who are motivated by ch social change. They want to bring this country back to pre-Civil War days. They want to establish a white male patriarchy, Christian-dominated uh, society, and they're willing to do so by violence. Uh, that group scares me a whole lot more than all the people we prosecute in court. And not just reported, is that also increasing? I will say that we don't encounter them in the criminal justice system. In fact, most of them don't have a, a criminal history. They are able to buy firearms at will because of that. Where we do see the intersection is often in domestic violence. Uh, and many of the people who come to our court as defendants who have, who have assaulted a, a, a woman in their life uh, are also uh, gun owners, and so we do have some tools to disarm those people. But uh, the, the hate crimes that we see are really people, often we end up putting them in the mental health court because they have severe behavioral health issues. It's not the, the scary white supremacists that we see uh, in engineering mass shootings. Well, to the thing that you're more worried about, Christopher Parker, you've written a lot about uh, white supremacy. Briefly, what did the election of Barack Obama have to do with the increase in white supremacist acts? So uh, thank you for the question. I, I want to make a clarification first about the difference between white supremacy, white nationalism, and Appreciate racism. Appreciate that. That's good. So white supremacy is a global ideology. One can find white supremacists in Europe. One can also find white supremacists here and in Latin America. So let me get that off the table right now. And then beyond white supremacy is what Dan referred to as white nationalism, right? That's a much more prescriptive 
approach to these things. White nationalists want, first and foremost, a white ethno-racial state, right? That is to say country. Um, there are also prescriptions when it comes to gender roles um, and everything else, you know, that has to do with in-groups and out-groups in the United States. Racism is part of these things, but racism is more directly a part of the way people act. Racism presupposes that, that there's power of one person over another person, and then they can enact these policies and, and in some ways, and sometimes violence, that uh, come from this sense of um, in-group, out-group um, antipathy. So I'll get to your point. To Barack Obama. Yo, Barack Obama. So what, what Barack Obama did was he's the first, you know, clearly non-white president. And that scared the, if I were in other company, I would say something else, but that scared the mess, the bull dookie out of people, right? <laughs> and, and, and what it did was, it, you know, because the president is so important in our national life, the president is the commander in chief of the military, the president is the face of the country abroad, the president, in short, is the embodiment of the, of the United States of America. And that was just too much for some people to take. And so what happened was it led to this reaction against that, right? So that's essentially what happened. And it scared people so much that they were willing to do anything and everything to take their country back. That's why you get this temporal reference when it came to the Tea Party that arose, that emerged after Obama got elected to take our country back. Dan, you are one of dozens of prosecutors from around the country who have written a letter to um, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Uh, asking for more gun control legislation. What, if any, do you think would be the impact of that letter? On Mitch McConnell? Not very much. Uh, <laughs> I walked into that one. Yeah, yeah but, but, I I, but, but part of the concern is, is the ease with which uh, military-style weapons can be purchased, with which ammunition can be stockpiled. And uh, the, you know, the mass shootings that we have seen in our country just it seems like every week uh, often involve well, they involve white males who are alienated, who are angry, who are in, a, and a, you know, there's a great irony here. My my white brothers uh, in are, are the most privileged cohort. They're also the most lethal cohort to others and to themselves. The rate of suicide among white males is the highest in the country. So, the guns are at the at the root of all of that. And these extremist groups know that they can stockpile guns, and many of them advocate what they call to uh, the, the move to accelerate what they consider the inevitable race war, the inevitable holy war that they have, and so they're, they're using their um, Second Amendment rights to buy as many weapons of war as they can. That part really is concerning, and, and local and federal authorities are doing their best to monitor it, but there's nothing that they can do to disarm these groups uh, until they do something. I want to come back to that demographic group that you're referring to, but are you really saying that there's no cachet to um, prosecutors from all over the country, they're law and order people, they're Democrats, they're Republicans. Well, the issue of gun control it transcends <laughs> any sort of cachet. And, and, and uh, this country is divided so severely in so many ways. And the fact that we're even having this conversation in 2019 shows that in the, in the six generations that have followed since the end of the Civil War, that this country has done a terrible job trying to reconcile what happened. I mean, America's bloodiest war was fought for the worst possible cause you can imagine, the, the right to enslave another person based on their race. That's what it was fought about, and that's what it's still being fought about. Many parts of the country, the Civil War is an unsettled issue. And there are pockets, even here in the state of Washington, where people want to cling to that. I and mean, we witnessed the, the controversy over the Confederate battle flag and Confederate statues. It's, it's because people haven't given up on it yet. And it's 150 years later, and we haven't come to grips with it as a country. So that segues um, to the election of Donald Trump. And, and Christopher, when you and I met earlier, <laughs> hang on, <laughs> when, when you and I met earlier, you said there actually, for, for many people of color, there's a silver lining to the election of Donald Trump. And that people go, why? What's the silver lining? So let me start this out by saying, now, hold on to your hats, right? I actually think <laughs> Trump getting elected is a great thing. <laughs> hold up. Uh, <laughs> I think because it removes all doubt uh, the fact that this is a racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic country, period, right? 
So now the question becomes, what can we do about it? What will we ultimately do about it? Now, Trump was elected in response to Obama, just like Obama was elected in response to Bush, right? These are all action and reactions, right? And so Trump getting elected, I mean, only in America, well, I shouldn't say that because you got the UK with Bojo, right? Just like he's on his way out, right? That's a whole different thing. What is with all these crazy white men getting elected, right? It's like, I, I, but you know what it is? No, seriously. They both uh, have no, the same hairdresser, no, do they not? <laughs> Real, real talk, no, real talk. You know what this is all about, both here and in Europe? It's this reaction to rapid social change, right? These people just can't take it. You have UKIP in Europe, the alternative for Deutschland in Germany. Uh, you have the Progress Party, even in Norway, right? These are all reactions to rapid social change. And so Trump is just another manifestation of that. So, so let me stay with you for a minute. Spasms of violence almost predictably follow advances in civil rights cycles. Yep, yep. yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. Marcus, hi. Hi. Come okay. well, well, Christopher, with, uh, census data is showing that uh, America is set to be a majority and minority nation by uh, 2044. Uh, do you see this white nationalistic ideology getting you know, worse in these targeting of you know, communities of color, such as you know, what happened in El Paso, um, you know, getting you know, worsening before you know, it, it gets better? And, and how do we sort of dismantle this ideology that, that underscores it? Well, short of an out-and-out out out race war, I don't see it getting any better, right? It's gonna, it's, it's, it's gonna, well, it's not gonna get any worse, is what I was trying to say. And there have been some studies that have shown, actually, let me correct you, it's 2042 now. This is gonna be a majority-minority country. And there have been studies that have shown that when white people are primed with this idea that the country is going to be a majority-minority country in 2042, that these people are more likely to support Trump. Right, so, which is, comes as, as, as no surprise. Um, so I, I don't think, and when we think about what's happening, right, these are functionally, by definition, lynchings, right? This is what this is. Lynching has returned to America, right? So let's make no mistake about that. So it is not gonna get any better, but I don't think it's gonna get a whole lot worse either outside of or short of an all-out race war. Katie. Well, that, I was going to ask both of you that si si similar question. We see the, this bubbling up in the 80s. We see it bubbling up in the 90s. It kind of comes up, but it goes away. It comes up and go well, it doesn't go away, but it you know goes back underground or it leaves the news. Is are we heading for some sort of a bigger crash, or is it Donald Trump will go away and we'll see this go back down again? I, I, I just be clear. These people were here before Trump. Yeah. He lifted a rock, and they all scurried out. And he gave them a little bit. Of, he said, "There's good people on both sides of the rock," and so they were given that sort of emboldenment. But, but when he's gone, they'll still be here, and they might even be angry. Yes, they might. And so, and yes, we'll be a, a majority minority country by 2042, and I think the Republican Party knows that, which is why voter suppression has become one of their main things that they're trying to do. Because they know if everybody who's eligible to vote votes, they have no chance of winning an election. And so this is going to be a very intense time for us to come to grips with who we are as a country. But the, the extremist groups are not going to go away silently. They are sitting on huge arsenals. They have a very tight ideology, they have a social network where that can help uh, recruit others. Uh, and so, so far, the, the, the mass shootings that we've seen have all been lone wolves. Mm -hmm. I don't know that, that that's always going to be the case. There may be some time that one of these little cells decides to go out in a blaze of glory and shoot up all their ammunition. So, so I, I want to encourage us all to be aware of this. It's not just a fringe element. It's real. It's not hypothetical. Yeah. It's here in the state of Washington, too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, let me, Dan is right on the money with that. The social science bears out what he just said. These people are always here. It's just a matter of something happening in the current political environment that, uh, that, that wants them or that provokes them to come out. They, they never completely go away. You had people that were part of the John Birch Society in the 1960s. If they're still alive, there were Tea Party supporters then, and they're Trump supporters now. They don't go anyplace. One other thing I like to say, back in the 80s, there was this whole idea about what's called cohort replacement, that older, more racist white cohorts would die out, and they would be replaced by younger, more progressive white cohorts. That has not happened, right? And so that social scientists were banding that about 30 years ago, and they're like, oops, wrong again. So, Dan, uh, Washington voters have passed three gun safety measures over the last five years. Uh, and we actually lead the nation in these voter-proof types of measures. When you and I spoke, you said, yes, we have these 
these voter approved uh, measures, but they, they overlay uh, the wild west of gun laws. What did you mean by that? Well, in Washington State, it's never been hard to get a gun here. And, and it, there are other states like New York and California where the, they're, it's very difficult to get a gun and they don't give out concealed weapons permits to people, to anybody. Uh, here, it's always been easy to get one. But I, I think based on the, the work of the Alliance for Gun Responsibility and the fact that the Puget Sound region has enough votes to change the laws of the state uh, and, and, the, and the initiative process in our state allows us to do what the legislature could never do, we have universal background checks. We have some more restrictions on, on assault rifles being purchased by someone who's over 21. And we have the Extreme Risk Protection Order, which is also known as the Red Flag Law, that, that a lot of people are looking at now in response Response to the mass shooting. And, and I want to know about that. So we have some experience with that. It was passed by 70% of the voters in 2016. Do extreme risk protection orders actually work? And you would know that yes. because you guys actually work with that. We have a unit in my office, 12 people in the office, wow. lawyers, advocates, uh, police from King County and, and Seattle who work with other jurisdictions. Uh, and we remove firearms whenever a judicial order uh, in a domestic violence protection order, either civil or criminal, or an extreme For risk up to protection one order. Year, you They're can temporarily it. removed. We, what we have found in the ERPO field, extreme risk protection okay, order, right. most of those are um, concerns about suicide. Families concerned, they found that's, writings. That's long been the case, right? Yes, right. and so the family can either petition the court or they can ask the police to stand in their shoes. The judge can order the removal of those those firearms. The question is, is, is that ERPO law something that could also be used if we were to find somebody who was plotting an act of violence, a violent racial extremist? And and the experience so far? We haven't had one of those yet, but I think, I think it is a tool that we could use on an individual. It's not gonna work on a large group. Tell us real briefly about the, it's the bead jar, not the bean jar, bead jar. Uh, we keep, keep track. Last year we, we seized 592 guns from uh, homes where domestic violence was a problem or from ERPOs and so we just we're trying to beat that every year. And before that, before we had this unit, we seized almost none. And so it, it is a law that we're giving effect to. It's, it's a smart law, uh, but it isn't a substitute for the kind of meaty gun control like banning the sale of weapons of war to citizens. Yeah, so Dan, you have uh, these uh, inter open internet sites like 8chain that are you know, blamed for radicalizing you know, young men into a white supremacist ideology, you know, such as uh, the case in El Paso. Is there any way to, given free speech considerations, is there any way to you know, hold uh, these type of online platforms to account when they can reason reasonably be you know, traced to this kind of violence? I'm aware that uh, some of our intelligence officers and law enforcement re regularly uh, survey those channels to see what's going on, what the conversations are. It's actually very useful evidence if you're trying to get a search warrant or go to court. Uh, but to monitor every social media site and, uh, and for content is just not possible for law enforcement. And the younger people, the younger extremists, are getting better at things like encryption uh, and hiding, and they talk in code, and they talk in, you know, so it, social media definitely is a place where people can gather who have um, interesting views together and uh, lift each other up and aff affirm whatever it is, whether it's, you know, the, the dog lovers of America or the... Easy, the Nazi, the, oh, easy, yeah. our next segment. Or, <laughs> or the, you know, or, and, and so certainly, and, and we follow it, they, they use code, they talk in code, they have symbols, they, uh, you see Pepe the Frog and things like that, when people use that as a way to communicate with each other and say, I'm on that team, are you on my team too? So, but other, for short of, you know, banning the internet, I don't know how that's gonna happen. So we have an audience question. Hi there, join us. Hello. Hi, thank you. Patty Hayes with Public Health Seattle, King County. Thank you so much. I'm really interested in your comments about extreme risk protection orders on how we develop the comfort in the community to use those because public health sees that as an essential strategy, but it's really underutilized, I believe. So extreme risk protection orders are a great tool, but we've only had it for a couple of years. We've only had our unit that gives effect to these judicial orders for about a year and a half. So yes, public education needs to be out there. We need, it needs to be part of every crisis line. We need to make sure people know if you have a loved one who who's seems to be fixated with violence, with school shootings, who's amassing weapons, uh, you have a tool. You can call, and it's, an, it's actually protectionorder.org is our website, and you can go in there and we will, we will provide help. You can come to the courthouse. We'll help you fill out the paperwork and stand there in front of the judge with you to make sure this happens. Katie, oh, Katie Sewell. Well, I, 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 no, no, no. Sorry, I was going to ask you for sorry, to ask you from both of your perspectives. 
Um, Start with from both of your expertise. You say that you know the dying off theory hasn't happened; that it didn't make these things go away. Um, but is there any anything effective? Like, if people in this room have family members that are starting to talk in this more radical way, is there anything socially or uh, you know through prosecution that can be done to change like the direction these people are going in? Can I speak of this? This has been the Dan Satterberg show you so go far. So. <laughs> Um, so one thing, I, one thing I'll say is that these people that are Tea Party supporters and hardcore Trump supporters, you can't talk to them, right? They are not coming back. Now, you have some Republicans that are sitting on the fence who are more establishment types that, yeah, they're a more amenable to other remedies for what's going on right now. And a lot of them have a lot of regret, right? I just published a piece that showed that, yeah, there are serious, there's a serious fissure in the Republican Party. You have the never Trumpers, right? They're still out there. They just, they're not public, but they're still out there. And you have the Trump supporters. That's one thing. Another thing I want to say is, is that people think that Trump supporters and Tea Partiers and even the Klan, there were a whole bunch of hillbillies who were uneducated, you know, hooking up with sheep in the shed, right? That's not who everybody was, Family right? program. <laughs> A lot of these people are very well educated. <laughs> Two thirds of Trump supporters have incomes in the upper half distribution of the income, right? So let's just keep that straight. But talking to Trump supporters, there are people in my family now. I got a black man, one of my cousins who voted for Trump. We can't even talk, right? Because <laughs> I, what, he's in la la land someplace. But, but anyway, you can't really talk to those people. They are gone, right? I, I, if people want to hear something different, sorry, go to another show, talk to somebody else, but they're not coming back. So Katie, I think your question is also about the First Amendment and, and the marketplace of ideas. And we have long cherished the right of another American to just to say terrible things, to repugnant things. Mm -hmm. And it only crosses that line when there's a threat that is made that's a re reasonable threat that is based on uh, singling out a victim because of their, they belong to a particular discrete class. And so you know, we're really careful when we look at hate crime cases that come into us to make sure that the motivation is clear uh, and it wasn't just something that was in the, in the midst of an of a argument that was about something else, somebody used a racial word, that's not what we prosecute. It's somebody who's targeted because they belong to a discrete uh, protected class. Christopher Parker, what is the connection between hate crimes and economic anxiety? That whole thing of you turn on others when, when economic times are tough. Well, you know what, I, the hate crime part, I mean, that's not in my wheelhouse. I'll have to defer to Dan on that. But the anxiety and the anger that's associated with the extreme right or just the right these days, I mean, they're, they're more willing to um, not necessarily commit violence, but they're more willing to look the other way. Now, if you think of what a real conservative, more establishment conservative uh, was back in the day, or I think continues to be now, what do they want? The first thing they want, they want, they're really about the rule of law, law and order, right? So for these people to claim that they're conservative, but they're okay, like with Trump saying, you know, hit them in the head and do all these other violent things, these people are pseudo conservative. They are not establishment conservatives. And one of the things I try to do in my work is say, look, you people who are establishment conservatives, you're not crazy, right? There's still some of you guys out there like this. Those are those other people that are getting out of line, you know, with the rule of law. But let me just say, let me say one last thing. These people are not crazy in a clinical way. Let's, let's get this straight. Uh, Frederick Douglass said well, once, long, long ago, power concedes nothing without demand. Never has, never will. So these people are not crazy to want to maintain their prestige. It's just the manner in which they do so is what makes them seem a little off kilter. And I'll add to that that, that, that every time we have a mass shooting and people want to talk about mental health, you know that's a head fake, right? That's so we don't look at the guns that they were using and how they got the guns and, and reducing the availability of the guns. So people who plan these things, they are by all any standard, without doing an analysis, they are legally competent. They understand right from wrong. They knew what they were doing. They weren't crazy. They weren't something that increasing our mental health resources would do. And by the way, the people who say we should do things about mental health never want to actually fund it either. So that's a head fake. We've got to be real careful about that. Hi there. Hi, I'm Bill Mowat. Uh, I'm a board member from the Anti-Defamation League locally, and I'm also a former Microsoft employee. And today, I listened to Brad Smith, who's the chief legal officer of Microsoft, talk about his new book, which is called Tools and Weapons, The Promise and the Peril of the Digital Age. And uh, it's just come out. And anyway, he's been talking about how 
corporations, technological corporations, can work together in to try to take advantage of maybe their expertise to try to, to limit some of the damage that's going on right now. And I'm just curious to hear from both of you, do you think that the technological world and the NGO world can be helpful towards government you know, NGOs and the academic world in terms of trying to solve these problems? Ooh, Dan was looking at me. I don't know. I'm just trying to figure this one out. <laughs> you were looking at him. <laughs> I have to think on this one for a second. Um, do you mean in terms of um, the uh, technology having a, a dispositive role in tamping down this violence, or do you mean tamping down, you know, this reactionary sentiment that we see? Is that, I need a little more specificity here. I, I guess I'd say both, but I, but I would say that having technological companies think about this and maybe try to work oh. to try to come up with a solution or possible solutions. Okay, to, so, here's, so here's a question. Okay, is it in their interest? Is it in the interest of their bottom line for this to happen? Because when we think about corporate social responsibility, right, when we think about if something happens racially, you know, Microsoft or whomever or Sears are like, damn, we don't want Jesse Jackson out here, right? And so, because that can impact their bottom line because you have boycotts. So I guess what I'm trying to understand is if, if this is in the, in the interest of their bottom line, yeah, I think they could, pop, they could do something if they really wanted to do something. But the question is, is this going to promote their business, right? That's the first question I think you have to ask. I would say that monitoring content on the internet is such a vast challenge that I don't know that anyone's wanted to say we can do that yet. And the other thing is that many of these technology companies have also advanced and sold on the market of phones, for instance, that have encryption technology. And so when law enforcement does get to it, we can't get into it. And so whatever evidence that might be in there has been blocked because that's what the consumer wants and that's what the market produces. Mm -hmm. So um, we're running out of time here, but I, I do want to ask you both something that we discussed pretty, pretty much earlier in the show. And that is the sort of frightening idea that um, for, for a small number of angry white, so far young men, uh, violence is almost like it's like a template. You, you are upset, you're angry about something, and then we all do the same thing. I, I don't understand how this became that template. And just thoughts quickly from both of you about how that became. So, how, how is this possible? So a few years ago, we had a young man at Seattle Pacific University who yes. took a gun there and was trying to shoot as many people as he could. He had writings that, that really expressed a lot of admiration for the Columbine shooters. There's a lot of copycat stuff here. A lot of lonely, disaffected young men who, who, who want to go out and have their name known like the Columbine guys. So that, that group of individual lone wolves, we got to worry about them. I'm also worried about the, the, the collective group of people who really are advocating violent social change in our community. That's real, too. Um, so, so I'll just say um, these people are going to remain out there because the society continues to change at too rapid a pace. There are too many brown people, too many black people are already here, too many Asian Americans, and too many women, you know, that are gaining some power, right? So that segment of the population, that's not changing, right? And we haven't even talked about the whole incel thing, which I think is fucking oops, ridiculous, right? You've done so well. I mean, <laughs> You've done so well. I'm sorry. No, I, I don't even somebody hit me up on this over drinks, right? I'm happy to talk to you about that. <laughs> But that is the epitome of white male privilege, frustrated white male privilege, feeling that they should have access to women's bodies, and because they don't, they become frustrated and go shoot people, right? So that, I, I can't even, that just really bugs me to no end. Like, I have two daughters, so I guess maybe yes, that has indeed. something to do with it. And we'll lose it right there. <laughs> we have been discussing white supremacy, violence, and gun safety with King County Prosecutor Dan Satterberg and Christopher Parker, professor at the University of Washington. We're coming right back with Seattle author Garth Stein. Thank you. <laughs> and we are back thinking about life from the perspective of a dog. And Enzo is his name. Garth Stein, author of the New York Times best-selling novel, The Art of Racing in the Rain, and several other works is our guest. Hi, hi Garth. Hello, Joni, how are you? So the first question is the how does it feel question. How does it feel to have uh, Kevin Costner, a gravelly voiced one, that sort of didn't even sound like Kevin Costner, that's me talking, not you, um, on a big screen? 
as your lead character of your book. Yeah, that's, that's, pre that's pretty weird. I have to put that under the category of very weird experiences that very few people get to have, so. The best drivers don't dwell on the future or the past. Set me free. The best drivers focus only on the present. I'll take it though, Kevin Costner, he's big, man. So you and <laughs> He sells you and tickets, he, man. Come we're on. at the, the same award ceremony or something. Yeah, yeah, Maybe back in 1991, I was in film school and I produced a short film uh, with a buddy of mine called The Lunch Date, which went on to win the Academy Award for live action Holy short smokes. in 1991. Adam Davidson was his name. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the same year that Kevin Costner won for Best Director for Dances with Wolves. So when they oh, told me Kevin Costner was doing the voice of Enzo, I thought there's some weird thing going on with that synchronicity. Really and Very cosmos, yes. Um, so the movie's out this summer. How, how's the movie doing? It's doing well. It's, I think it's not doing the numbers they were hoping for, but it's, a, it's the movie, so it's fine. It's good. It's all uh, good. Okay. <laughs> the book. Let's I'll go have back you to know, the book went to number one on the New York Times bestseller it, it, list. It did so, for two weeks, yes, right? Is that yes. right? Okay, so in the creation of this book, I, I would like to know, seriously, how big a risk was it for you to make your lead character, your narrator, a dog? I mean, you were hanging a whole book <laughs> yeah. on a canine. That's funny. How big of a risk was it? Well, if I, if I were doing it today, I wouldn't do it. But because? when I did it... No, wait, why? Well, let me tell you the story. When I did it 11 years ago, I had nothing to risk because I didn't have anything. <laughs> I had written two books and nobody had read them and so I was working on my third book and nobody cared and nobody wanted to read it and, no, and I sent it off to my agent uh, in New York and he promptly called me up and said, I, I can't sell this book. No one will read a book narrated by a dog. Okay, so uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> Tell us just briefly for folks who are interested in you but didn't necessarily read the book. Yeah. Shocked that that could be. Um, the plot, the, just the real synopsis. Uh, it's, it's a book that's told from the point of view of Enzo the dog. Uh, Enzo is... His master is a race car driver, and Enzo is convinced he's gonna be reincarnated as a person in his next life, so he studies the world around him so he will come back as a really good person and be ready to go. And since he, his master is a race car driver, he studies race car driving in particular. And since I live in Seattle, he studies it at Pacific Raceways down in Kent. <laughs> Um, you, you, you essentially use the viewpoint of a dog to comment on things like love, loyalty, unfulfilled dreams. What should we, should we all in this room learn about life from Enzo, i.e. you? <laughs> <laughs> Enzo is a fictional character. Oh, there you go. Um, you know, it's funny that everyone uh, really uh, co comes awake when, oh, narrated by a dog, they read, they, they, they think of their dog, they, they want to. I get tons of emails from people all about their, their dogs. And we have a Are very- Are you kind of a dog whisperer now? I, I, I've become the dog guy. Yeah. I, yeah, I definitely know about. Any dog who's sick or has passed my condolences, I will get an email about it. It's okay. <laughs> the, but it's fine because we have this very special relationship with our animals, right? We have very, we, we love it. And why do we, we have this unconditional love we give to our pets, our dogs specifically, that we kind of hold back from the people around us? We always put qualifications on what, how we're going to give people love. I, I, oh, you said this, therefore I did that. And if you hadn't done that, then I wouldn't have done this. And we're always jockeying and playing this game. So I think that if what the book, if you can take anything away from the book, I think that we should all learn to teach, treat each other more like dogs. I see. <laughs> in, a good, in a good way. You know what I'm talking about, right? So that's perfect setup for you, Katie. Yeah. Um, uh. So there's been more and more studies that are discovering that, that dogs do think, they do assess, they have an emotional intelligence. I almost have two questions in a way. Did you study dog cognition to <laughs> write this character at all? Or were you just sort of going with a... I, I did not. <laughs> she has a friend who did study dog. I do, really? I have a friend who yes, did. Yes, indeed. No, I, I never thought of Enzo as a dog. I thought of him as a nearly human soul trapped in a dog's body because his whole goal is to reincarnate as a human in his next incarnation. So it, it never really occurred to me that there was an issue you know, writing from a dog's point of view. So I was a little surprised when my agent said no. But Fair enough. And, and I fired him. Was, was there a do I'm sure people have been asked, but was there a dog in your life where you looked at him and while you're sitting there at the keyboard with the cursor blinking and you're like, yeah. what should I do for my third book? <laughs> I mean, I, is there a dog in the story that there is a, this happen? Is there a real, a real Enzo? Dog. Is that a, well, not a real Enzo, but a real dog that like sparks your idea about this. 
Well, our latest dog, Comet, unfortunately passed away about 14 months ago. 14 months and six days ago. <laughs> How many hours? <laughs> roughly. <laughs> roughly. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're, I'm, I'm between dogs right now. You know, but uh, I, when, when the time is right, I know one will come uh, and that will be fine. Um, but, you know, I think that I wasn't, as I said, she wasn't necessarily, actually Comet was so goofy and silly, she was totally not Enzo. Mm -hmm. Comet, Comet has a few more lifetimes to live as a dog before she's going to come back to the person. <laughs> I think that's the easiest way to answer it. Fair enough. Marcus. Yeah, well, there's always a creative license whenever there's a, a book to movie adaptation. Was there ever a, a scene in the movie where you were like, they really, really got that passage wrong? Or? I, uh, in the interest of my children's college education, I'm gonna have to <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you got to take the a truth. pass on that. <laughs> 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 um, look, things have to change for an adaptation, and I totally get that. Um, they can't go in and change the book. So I always, ha I always have that. Um, you know, there's trade-offs, and, and getting Kevin Costner and, and Milo Ventimiglia and Amanda Seyfried, and I mean, the, the weight that a Hollywood you know, fit movie puts out, it, it's, it's good. Did they make changes? Yes. Was I happy with all of them? Not necessarily, but they got the heart of the movie in the right place. And, and it, that's what's important to me. So, you know, good for them. If you, if you want the full-on experience, um, buy a copy of the book from your local independent bookseller. <laughs> <laughs> no, but to that point, there's, you know, we can all sort of uh, appreciate and even respect that they have to change the movie a little bit. We get that. But what was the wince moment? And I am mindful of your children's um, <laughs> education. But it's not the, what, was, what was one change that you were like, ah, why'd you do that? Um, there was a scene um, that, they, that my wife and I both, after seeing the movie together, talked about it, and we said, they missed this. There needed to be this dramatic scene because it kind of undermines, it's a theme thing, so it's whatever. You, I, I could if, get into the nuts and bolts if you really wanted to, but we don't have to. But it was a thing. And so then a few weeks later, I was having lunch with the director, and we were talking, and I was like, God, I really would have loved to see that scene. He's like, oh, yeah, we, we, we wrote that scene. We just decided not to shoot it. <laughs> and I said, OK, I hope the film does super well. <laughs> because it's, it changes the dramatic kind of integrity of, the, of, the, of a certain storyline. Anyway, so it's OK, man. It's all good. It's all good. Dude, I just, I just turned in my new book today. I mean, come on. And we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. We have to I build know. to it. Sorry. I'm still in the movie. I'm um, a little excited. So plot development. Um, the parents of the lead character wife used, yes. this is complicated, used the death of their daughter to get back at a son-in-law that they never really liked. And that's, it's kind of wicked, but it drove, um, it drove the book. Mm -hmm. One of my takeaways, maybe, people can behave badly after a death. What, what, what were you, or Enzo, to be clear, trying to say there? Uh, uh, so, you know, with, the, with the idea of the, the, the so-called evil twins. As you call them, the evil twins. Yes. These are the parents. Yes, the, this, this, the parents who are suing for custody. Yeah, they, people do. I'm, look, I, the bottom line is the book is told from the point of view of a dog. And my dog in my head, Enzo, was very uh, you know, black and white. There's not a lot of gray there. You're either on our, you're with us or you're against us, and there's no middle ground. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's Denny and his ilk, he's like all Denny man. Denny being the lead Denny character. Denny being the, lead, the main character, the, the master. He's, that's like all thumbs up, right? And then anybody who's against Denny is the most evil, foul thing on the planet. So were the evil twins in reality that evil? I don't know. We're being told from a very biased point of view. That's the, kind of the concept of the, the bias is built in, is baked into the book. Seattle is one of the most dog-obsessed cities in the country. As everybody's read, we know that there's, there's more dogs than, than children in this city. I actually discovered that as a, the demography reporter for the Seattle Times a long time ago. But anyway, how much did Seattle dog passion, because you really base your books in Seattle, how much did that inspire this book? I, well, look, I, I, I'm, I grew up in Seattle. I live in Seattle. I, I do go around the country and, and they all claim to have a lot of dogs too, but so, <laughs> but um, you know, it's sort of I. Gr it's it's hard to see it when you're in it, kind of thing. Yep. It's like it is a very 
a very dog-centric city. I mean, it, it's, it's really quite amazing and, and fun and enjoyable, uh, as long as we're all being responsible and picking up after our <laughs> little pets. That's a public service message brought to you by <laughs> Seattle Department of and Dog Earth's Poop. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Got nothing. Yeah, well, obviously, the, oh, one of the themes that emerges in, in the book and the, the movie is uh, reincarnation. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is your writing in general and, and, and in this book specifically, is any of it you know, informed by religious or spiritual experience? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, not religious, but spiritual. Uh, I'm a very spiritual person. All my books have a certain amount. Like the book I wrote after The Art of Racing in the Rain, A Sudden Light, takes place in a fictionalized version of the Highlands. Um, and that's a very, uh, it's about ghosts in a very spiritual way. Um, I, I do have a strong spiritual background. I have a weird uh, background. My, my father was a good old Jewish boy from Brooklyn, and my mother is Irish and Clinton Indian from southeastern Alaska. So it, we had kind of a mishmash, and my parents tried to give us some kind of theology, but it didn't take, but the spirituality took, so. Katie. Totally off of spirituality. I, uh, <laughs> uh, so many, I mean, people here, the Hollywood system is, is so hard for writers. Mm. So many books get optioned, sometimes over and over and over again, and scripts get written, and people get cast, and movies are never made. Why do you think this movie was actually made? Um, I, I, I have some theories. Because it was, a, it was optioned for, for two initial option periods, and then Universal Studios at the time uh, pur purchased it outright, hmm. which is really great for my kids' college education. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Way awesome. And, and, but they bought it. Usually, they could just let it go, and then, some, then someone else keeps on going into option, where it's, it's not that much money. But you know, they put a lot of money into it. And I suspect that's because the, the head producer is Neil Moritz who produces the Fast and the Furious movies and literally makes them billions of dollars. This is not a joke. He makes multi-billions of dollars for Universal Studios. So when he says, you got to give Garth some money, they're like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I kind of think that he, I think Neil Moritz got it made uh, by sheer you know, force. And, uh, and it's great that it got set up eventually at Fox is where it ended up, so, which is now Disney, ironically, and we can get into the film business. If you you like. So I'd like to remind the audience, if you have a question, come on around because we'll run out of time and you won't get to ask your question. Please join us. Um, so Garth, you also wrapped this story around auto racing. And so we all want to know, are you a participant and, and at what level? Uh, I raced for a few years with SCCA, Sports Car Club of America. Um, and what with were you driving? I was driving a Miata. Spec Miata is the class that I drove. Did you smash it or what? <laughs> Why are you I no longer have, in it? I might have smashed one or two. It's, okay. No, no. Is that, it's true. It's true. I, I, uh, because I you had to, because watch, watching the movie and reading the book, I mean, you know a lot about what happens on different curves and if yeah, it's yeah, wet yeah. or dry or whatever. Well, I raced, I raced for a number of years and had a really good time doing it. I did end up you know, getting out of racing uh, after I put my, what we like to say, stuffed my car into the wall. Um, it has, a, it has at, an at, elegant term, but yes, that's great. <laughs> At Pacific Raceways, it happened to be raining, yes, of course, and uh, I got, my car was just annihilated, but I was fine. They pulled me out, they got me checked out in medical, and I went to the infield and called my wife for my cell phone, and I said, honey, the good news is I'm okay, and the bad news is my car is destroyed, and she said, and the good news is you're retired. <laughs> and did that hold? Oh, yeah. That held? That, that did hold, oh, it I did see. hold. I like being married, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> we have an audience question, hello, hi. Hi, I'm Rose. I live out in West Seattle. I am a dog lover. And so my question is really about how you um, came up with the story. So how did you develop the storyline of not just that Enzo would be the, the narrator, but how it would develop and, mm -hmm. and end up being resolved? Yeah, it's a, I can try and make this brief. I'll try. Uh, the first idea for the book came to me when I was, I was still living in New York. I went to school in New York and lived there for 18 years and made documentary films. And I had seen a film um, called State of Dogs, uh, which was made in Mongolia. And it was about this belief in, in the, among the people in the high desert of Mongolia that the next incarnation for their dog will be as a person. And I thought, that's a really cool idea. 
but I don't know, I don't know what to do with that. And then years passed, and I was here listening to uh, Billy Collins. For Seattle. He was reading with Seattle Arts and Lectures at Ben Roy Hall. And it's like 2004 or something. And he was reading one of his poems called The Revenant, which is words from the dead. So it's narrated from doggy heaven. Um, and it's, it, the first line of the poem is this. I am, he, um, I am the dog you put to sleep, as you like to call the needle of oblivion. Come back to tell you this simple thing. I never liked you. <laughs> and when I heard that and everyone laughing, I said, that's my dog. <laughs> OK, so you're probably the exact wrong person to ask this question. But <laughs> do we all anthropomorphize our dogs, our pets, too much? Too much? When, when, you know, when you see it, when you see it, how do you know, <laughs> or something like that? I mean, that. geez, man, we should start dogomorphizing our friends and our families. <laughs> come here, come on. Come on, if I did that to my 12-year-old when he came home from school, he would be like, is that OK? Come here, puppy, come on. I, I mean, I, I don't think we do. Was that a yes or a no? I was a little confused. Listen, we're, our, our, our light, we're, we're put on this world to, to feel magic, man. We're not here to just be analytical about everything. We're here to anthropomorphize. We're here to imagine stuff. Come on, people. You're getting two dots and dashes or ones and O's or whatever that's all. Oh, thing. good no. But so, I'm not uh, trying to be a Luddite or anything. No, I no, no. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Um, but so what if we do have a super smart dog? Should we assume that they're judging us? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you should assume everyone is judging you all the time. Very good. <laughs> I kind of do. Katie, do you think right, people are so judging? This, this book is a behemoth for you. Like you said that you had two that came out before. This one comes out, and all of a sudden, everybody wants it. Everybody's reading it. Yeah. And that's amazing and fantastic, and now you're a known name. But is there a burden that comes from that also? Probably. But you don't feel, you don't feel I don't like know, that. man. I'm in denial so much, Katie. I gotta be honest with you. If I were well adjusted, I wouldn't be writing books. You know, if I had gone through the proper psychotherapy and all that, I'd have a job. I would be a normal person. I, it's just, I don't know. I, I guess there are expectations. I'm sure my agent does and my publishers do. I, I'm not concerned. I gotta write what's true to me, and however long it takes, and whatever it's about, it's you know it's gotta come from my heart because that's where this book came from, and that's what people resonate with. And so we let the marketing people do the marketing. Mm -hmm. I'm writing a book about two 87-year-old ladies right now, so. So tell us about that. I just turned it in. Oh my and god! It's, it's called a couple of old birds. A couple of old they birds. They of course live in Seattle. Everybody in your books are in Seattle, right? Yeah. It's, in, it's inspired by my mother, who's 89, but it's not, it is not my mother. <laughs> sure it isn't. My sure it isn't. My mother is convinced. She's going around telling everybody, oh, my son wrote a book about me. I'm like, no, mom, no, no. <laughs> That's what you say. <laughs> no, no, it's, it, it's just my mother's 89, and she you know, still goes tapping every week, and she still does yoga and walks around Green Lake and you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, and she like comes up with like all sorts of funny comments all the time. And I'm like, that's a good character. And so I developed this story about it's Seattle centric about two 80 something year old ladies who become new best friends late in life. And it's sort of like when they're supposed to be like thinking about ending the story, um, they discover there's a whole new chapter. What part of Seattle do they live in? Uh, they live in Madison Park. That's part of the that's part of the thing. Don't worry, it all makes sense to you. <laughs> Is that what they said when How you hand? Does it come out? Uh, <laughs> oh, please, please come around if you want, uh, Marcus. Yeah, well, I know a lot of fans of the of the art of racing, you know, in, in the rain, say that uh, viewing uh, the world through a dog gives them greater appreciation for uh, human life. What was for you? What what life lesson did you take away from writing this book? I think that's a good that's a good one. I mean, the the, the reason the book works for me as a writer is it it's an, it's the alien point of view you know it's the outsider dropped down into a world and being able to comment on it and so because Enzo is a dog and is so kind of clever and funny and all that we identify we, we identify with him and say whatever he says is true and so he has some crazy some good ideas really good observations but some kind of not so good observations he's convinced that men are actually descended from dogs and not from monkeys, and he's a little resentful about it. <laughs> so, you know, um, having that sort of outsider perspective uh, um, is a way to shed light on the human condition and, and learn about what we feel as people. So, uh, how to improve as a person 
you know, I, I'm surprised that it, it, I'm not surprised, you know, people say is it beyond my wildest dreams, the success of this book, and I say my dreams are pretty wild, you should be, you'd be surprised, but <laughs> it's done, it has really reached out to a lot of people of all different demographics, and I, I often wonder why, and I, I do believe it's because from a, told from a point of view, it has a great sense of humanity. And I think that we're kind of craving that right now in our society. We, think we want to this human touch, this human connection. Well, maybe another way to, to ask about that, you had another book, um, A Sudden Light, mm -hmm. takes place in the Highlands, near where you grew up, but you yeah. didn't grow up in the Highlands. Right. So first, can you just tell us a quick synopsis of that? And then if a book like that doesn't sell as much as mm -hmm. The Art of Racing in the Rain, I don't know, are your feelings hurt or do <laughs> yeah. you? You just move on. You go on to the old birds. Yeah. It, uh, so, a sudden light. It's a multi-generational family saga set against the timber industry, um, and it's about fathers and sons, and it's about the, our connection to the world around us and nature. But it's also about peeling back the layer and trying to see behind the screen to see how you know to see through to other dimensions. And so, there's a sp very spiritual element to it. Uh, it did very well for a book. If, I, if that had been for a, book? <laughs> for a novel that comes out, oh, I see. It, it, it's, you know, it did, anybody would be thrilled to have the numbers that it sold. It didn't do Enzo numbers. So will that follow me for the rest of my life? Yes, I'm sure it will. <laughs> you know, is it, what, how, what do I do about it? I, you know what, I, I, that's where I gotta go Zen and say, I'm doing my thing and hopefully I'll write another book that people will resonate with. And, and if not, you know, Reading a book is a very intimate experience, and it's a real connection between a writer and a reader. So honestly, you have to be thinking about one person. You have to write for one person who isn't your mother or your wife, <laughs> and hope that they get it. And if they do, then good. And if they tell 10 well, million people, good. Well, speaking, speaking of your wife, uh, part of the origin story of the art of racing in the rain has to do with you sort of doubting yourself and you showing the book uh, the original manuscript to your wife. Yeah, I, that's I, part of the origin story, is it not? Yeah, well, I, I was working on a different book, and I had to ask permission to start a new book because that's how it works in our family. I asked my wife for permission to start a book. I don't know how that gets set up, but <laughs> <laughs> that's what time machines are for. It's okay, it's good. And then I wrote a bunch of pages, and I gave them to her to read, and she's like, "Oh wow, you're really onto something." She said, "But you can't name you. You, you got the wrong name for the dog." When I first started writing oh, the book, what was the name? When I first, Enzo was not named Enzo when I first started. Enzo was named Juan Pablo. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Juan Pablo or, or Montoya not. is a great <laughs> racing champion. And so I thought, that's a great name. You know, I could name this dog Juan Pablo. It would be really cool. And I gave it to her, and she said, there's just one thing. You can't name the dog Juan Pablo. And I'm like, why not? She's just, just no, just don't do it. <laughs> and then she's the one who suggested Enzo. So I do have to give her full credit for, for, for Enzo's name. Hi there. We have an audience question. Hello. Hi. Hi, how are you? Um, I was just curious, with this level of success, obviously, and your investment in the Seattle community, with you getting involved in the community, has this allowed you to kind of get more involved in the community, getting involved with philanthropy? What's motivated you to give back in the community? And how has that changed since you've had this added success and ability to really impact change at a greater level? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I did get a lot of opportunities, and I tried to do what I could with them. Uh, we started a nonprofit organization called Seattle Seven Writers, uh, which has served for 10 years, serving the literary community in the Northwest. Uh, it started as seven of us, thus the name, and then... Which you took from the, the guys who closed down the highway earlier. It's true, we did steal uh, <laughs> the name, but also we had Kate, uh, Kit Baki was one of our original seven, and she, and she is one of the, she has a background, she has a history, let's say. And so uh, that's what we went with. We ended up being 93 of us, um, all great of well-known and lesser-known uh, authors in uh, Seattle area. And we did good deeds and raised money for literacy and, and did a lot of outreach and stuff like that. For 10 years, we've wound down just because it seemed the lifetime of the... You had sort of an, a retirement party for the group Yeah, we had a summer. retirement party. And so why was this the right time to, to end that? 10 years is a long time, and we have you know, we want to do other things, and we want to write books. And, and Jenny Shortridge, uh, my partner, uh, executive director, and I, we, we're kind of like, we need to move on, and and we don't want to have to struggle through anything. Let's just shut it down and do, you know, shake, pet each other on the back. Uh, we both moved on to do other things. I'm now on the board of Hugo House, for instance. So I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'll be out there doing as much I can for literacy in, in the Northwest. How would you say that the culture of Seattle writers has changed over those 10 years? 
Uh, how, how has the culture changed? Um, I don't know if it has. Has it? I guess it probably has. I don't know if I circulate enough, Katie. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, for you personally, like with that group, as it evolves from seven people into 93, are you seeing uh, trends and like the types of writers that here, the you know, vibe, the... Yeah, no, I, I, I get what you're saying. I think that what was interesting is that we were an ent entirely volunteer organization and, and I would kind of put the screws to people who were very well well known. I would go up to Eric Larson, I would go up to Tim Egan, and I would say, I'd call him up and I'd say, hey, guess what, we're doing something. Oh, when I say we, I mean you, and you're, we're not paying you anything. And they would be like, okay, I'm giving, because you know, everybody pitched in and volunteered and did their, their part. So I think that that was kind of, the fact that so many writers wanted to get out and teach classes and wanted to get out and do you know, a public event uh, and donate the proceeds and do all that kind of stuff was really uh, it was it was it was nice it was heartwarming I, th I think we all do want to give to our community sometimes we don't know exactly how to do it and so we became a conduit for people um, what is the best piece of advice that you were ever given as a writer and what is the single bit of writing coaching advice that you would give to the budding novelists right here today Best piece of advice I was ever given was on my second novel. Another writer friend of mine, I gave him to read an early beta read kind of thing, and he uh, he called me up and he said, uh, I think it's great, I think this, this, he had all sorts of stuff, and then he said, he thought for a second, he said, you know what, what I would do? I would go through your book and cut the last sentence of every paragraph. Oh, and I, I thought like, the last sentence of every paragraph was the one that was supposed to pop the most. Well, the problem is that I was doing, and I'm not going to say other people do this, but for me, what I was doing is I wasn't trusting my readers that they were getting what I was saying, so I would always say oh, it again you were one last it up, time. Summing it up, I see. Yeah, and so I, I, was, I went through and I thought, that's you got to trust your reader. So his that, the code of what his advice was was trust your reader. The reader Very wants nice. to do the work. They're they're there for you, and use that to your advantage. And the advice I always give to young writers is take acting classes. <laughs> Take acting, acting. classes. Take acting oh. classes. Specifically, so you can hear the dialogue? Is that what you no, mean? No. Specifically, yeah. take improvisation acting, improvisational acting, because actors need to know everything. that they, they need to know where they came from, what is in their mind, what they're going through, what they're trying to get. They know intention. They know motivation. They never, an actor never walks onto stage not knowing exactly what he or she is supposed to be doing. We, writer, writing gets slack when writers don't know what their characters are supposed to be doing, so they kind of push them around. Oh, he walked into the house. Why do you walk into the house? Because the house is on fire or because his car is on fire? Because, give us a reason for it and that energizes everything. So acting will teach you that discipline. So we're running out of time here. I just want to ask you really quickly. I was grateful to the movie makers. Um, instead of just showing you know, a bunch of Seattle eye candy tours mm -hmm. and spots, and the movie wasn't really filmed in Seattle, no. right? Where was it? It was filmed in Vancouver. So that house was in Vancouver. It was, so they just had some scenery, but I was really grateful to them for not sort of overdoing the Seattle scenery. Here's the, here's yeah, the, yeah. the I can't, I want to know what you've they, they did. They, they shot here for a few days. Uh, they had a really good photographer. Um, Jeff Zwart uh, does all these like really cool uh, Porsche commercials. And he did all, of, anything with a car in it, he, he shot. So that was very, very impressive. They did use it very well, I thought. In Seattle, you know, the Mercer Street off-ramp and stuff like that. We know Fuzzy Wuzzy Rug Company used to be there, but in fact, they say that's where the garage is. It's not there. <laughs> but it's okay. They, they did do, but you know, they shoot in Vancouver because of the... Because we don't have the film industry incentives, I know well, that. Well, we, we don't have and incentives, that's right. And we can talk about that if you'd like. I gotta go. <laughs> we can talk about it some other time, okay. is, what, is what you were I trying think we to should. say. And just the minor, right amount of rain there. We have been talking about books, dogs, and literacy in Seattle with acclaimed author Garth Stein. Civic Cocktail returns in October with Congressman Adam Smith from Washington's 9th Congressional District. As many of you know, he's the chairman of the U.S. House Armed Services Committee. Thank you so, so much for watching. <laughs>